So uh, we are very happy to have uh, Francois uh, Farquet from Oracle Labs today. And he's going to talk about exploring uh, speed, up, speed up opportunities in the GraalVM compiler. And it'll cover the different approaches the GraalVM compiler team applies in the quest of performing the compiler. Francois is a principal performance engineer at Oracle located somewhere in the Swiss Alps, I believe. He's a member of the GraalVM compiler team in charge of benchmarking, performance tracking, and hyperparameter tuning. Thank you, and please take this away, Francois. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Uma, for the introduction. Uh, as you said, yes, I will talk about uh, finding speed up opportunities, basically how we track uh, performance in the GraalVM team and uh, what kind of techniques we apply to try uh, finding uh, uh, more opportunities and try to find the uh, low hanging fruits. So uh, I, yeah, I'm a principal performance engineer in the GraalVM compiler team, uh, working remotely uh, in uh, Switzerland. And you can find me on Twitter uh, with the end all written on the slide. Um, okay, this is the legal slide. Uh, since it's the first talk, let's just uh, cover just the broad aspects of uh, GraalVM, since I will talk uh, about some part of it, but uh, there will be great uh, other talks today about different uh, aspects of GraalVM that I will not cover. Um, so basically, GraalVM uh, is a JVM that can run uh, JVM languages. Um, the default approach is to run them in the context of OpenJDK as a replacement uh, compiler for the uh, uh, for uh, the hotspot compiler. You can also run other languages like Ruby or Python, JavaScript, all implemented on top of the Truffle framework, and they can interrupt transparently uh, seamlessly uh, without uh, boundary. Uh, there are also uh, the possibility of running C, C++, and all uh, native languages uh, through the LLVM uh, uh, interpreter. Note that uh, I will cover and talk about uh, running a Graal compiler as a JIT compiler only in this talk. So this is what's shown in there as part of OpenJDK. Uh, but GraalVM can do more than that. It can run uh, those languages as part of uh, Node the Node.js platform. Uh, also, as part of the Oracle database, there has been an, an announcement uh, lately that uh, Oracle um, DB21C includes uh, JavaScript as a, a way of running uh, uh, functions inside the Oracle data database. So that's pretty exciting. It's using GraalVM uh, inside the, the database as part of a, a product now. And um, there is also the possibility of writing, uh, I mean, of, of generating native images, uh, standalone binaries. So GraalVM comes in two flavored, community edition and the enterprise edition. Uh, I'll cover performance aspects that are part uh, of both, uh, either community uh, or enterprise. Uh, so basically the enterprise edition provides uh, additional performance uh, by having more uh, optimizations uh, and uh, more advanced techniques as part of, of the compiler also has support and uh, some security features, etc. So you can download it on crudbm.org slash downloads. Okay, so the core of my talk will be about uh, improving the JIT compiler performance. Uh, so we have to start with the basic. So what is performance and uh, what do we want to optimize for? So usually there are there's one main metric uh, people care about is peak performance. So that's uh, uh, the throughput or, or sometimes latency, depending on the benchmark, uh, at steady state. So it means that you let the JVM warm up. And once you reach the steady state, uh, you, you report the value uh, at this stage. So you ignore the warm up. But sometimes it's good to look at, uh, at warm up too. So you want to check your warm up time, which is basically the time to reach. Uh, the peak performance. Note that from a compiler team point of view, it's not uh, the only things that are important. There are other metrics one want to watch, uh, especially compilation time. 
because that's extra resource, but that's also time spent in the compiler trying to find optimizations. And if uh, if you spend a lot of time uh, trying to, to find an opportunity and there is uh, not much that you can do in the end, maybe it's worth uh, 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 skipping that step. Uh, code size also, if you your generated machine code is very large, that can be problematic. It's also a, a lot of resources that you use and same for memory footprint. So <clears throat> as examples of those metrics, last year's um, opening talk was given by Tom uh, Rodriguez, part of uh, the, the compiler team too. And he talked about libgraal, which is uh, an out-of-type compiled version of the of the Gral compiler. Uh, the Gral compiler is written in Java, so you can compile it uh, to a native image using uh, the Gral VM native image technology uh, to a single standalone binary. And uh, interestingly, this is this was a lot of effort, but this brings little benefit in terms of peak performance, but it reduces the the footprint of uh, of uh, Gral VM. Uh, significantly by improving your warm-up time and your compilation time and uh, also your footprint. So uh, another example would be when uh, one modifies the inliner, uh, it can affect obviously the peak uh, performance and, um, and the warm-up greatly, but uh, one needs to be careful about the code size, uh, typically, because if you are too regressive and you align everything, uh, in some cases, your performance could still uh, look great or stay uh, the same, but uh, you would uh, you would blow up your code size and uh, and potentially with little uh, peak benefit. So there are good trade-offs that, that need to be found there. It's not as simple uh, as looking at a single number. That's my point here. Okay, so now how to improve the, the performance. So there are several aspects. The first one is compiler research and development, what most uh, of the team does. Uh, David, who's on the call, uh, works on, the, on, on this aspect. So applying novel techniques, uh, exploring uh, new graph patterns that one wants to optimize, uh, adding new interest six, investigate patterns that uh, that have been reported by the community on uh, GitHub or on Twitter, or, or also patterns provided by customers, which are very, uh, we, we can have um, a sensitive, uh, I mean, critical path that that uh, that they want to, to be sure that it's uh, highly optimized. Um, note that also new technology that can, uh, that, uh, can be taken into account when uh, the Graal project started. Uh, Scala was a fairly fresh uh, uh, language. And uh, the compiler has been designed with Scala in mind. So trying to optimize also the, the Scala patterns and the, the bytecode produced by, by Scala workloads, which is quite different than, uh, than the one produced by uh, uh, Java workloads. Same for Java streams. And we also need to keep uh, up to date with the popular frameworks that, uh, that arrive and we need to make sure that we optimize those properly. Uh, thankfully, popular frameworks tend to sometimes provide a benchmark that we can evaluate on and, and try to, to push our performance for, further uh, there. So that's for the compiler aspect, uh, the core compiler uh, aspect. And then there is uh, obviously performance tracking and uh, how we track uh, regression typically and try not to uh, to regress and, and be worse than uh, yesterday's performance. And uh, I'll talk also about uh, how to chase opportunities from within the, the compiler. So once you have the compiler that works well, how you can push it further and try to, to make it even faster. Okay, so day-to-day -day performance tracking. Uh, regression tracking is uh, trying to make sure that uh, today's performance is better or equal than yesterday's. Uh, here's an example of a, a, a very simple micro benchmark uh, that, that uh, has a y-axis in uh, milliseconds. So you have the in yellow, so the hotspot performance. Then you have uh, in pink, the, the community edition performance. And then you have the enterprise edition uh, performance. Okay. 
but it can be more complicated than this. Uh, sometimes charts uh, look like that, and uh, it makes uh, regression tracking more complicated. And uh, you want to be sure to to capture an actual regression, but you can just uh, blindly con uh, compare uh, this commit's performance with the previous commit's performance. The y the x axis is uh, uh, different commits. Yeah. So here clearly there is a, a problem in the benchmark. Uh, or somewhere uh, in, in the benchmarking process, and, and we need to, to understand what's going on. The reason of such instability can be uh, various. One, it can be the, the JVM itself. So it can be uh, sometimes there are two culprits, uh, most of the time there are two culprits. Uh, one can be GC, uh, creating spikes uh, because the pose happen at the moment you're measuring uh, your final performance. But it can also be uh, the compiler itself. Uh, the, the, the example in the chart here is um, it's uh, it's a problem uh, with the inliner, uh, which which um, in this micro benchmark, uh, if if the if it compiles one uh, method before the other, the outcome can be worse, and uh, the the the, the multimodal behavior that we see here. But uh, another reason can be the benchmark itself. Um, the Renaissance Benchmark Suite, the, the open source suite, uh, has uh, several uh, Spark benchmarks. And Spark, for instance, uh, every 30 minutes uh, decides to spawn some process and do some cleanup tasks. And this is, if you, if you, if you measure performance at this stage, uh, you, you may uh, notice a, a difference in performance. Another reason can be the infrastructure, because it's hard to properly isolate and reproduce uh, uh, your uh, workloads we can i mean we could do a full talk on how to design a proper benchmarking infrastructure uh, but basically you need to try to make it as reproducible as possible and try to eliminate uh, external uh, impact on on the application but there there will always be noise reported as part of uh, uh, of the, the, the final number, which will be due to in infrastructure. Okay, so in day-to-day -day performance tracking, what we do, we compare against a, a baseline. The most obvious baseline is the hotspot compiler, which is the mostly used, uh, the most used compiler uh, uh, in the world uh, at the moment. And um, we have to be careful with compare against against hotspot because it's a moving target. So I haven't seen uh, uh, lots of performance changes in JDK 8 lately, but JDK 11, uh, uh, for instance, still has some uh, some important uh, changes uh, getting um, into. So we need to make sure that uh, that uh, we track that properly. Um, this is, I mean, there are two kinds of, uh, of changes in the JDK, I mean, in, in Hotspot. There can be JDK uh, library changes, or they can be Hotspot improvements. So for JDK libraries, uh, usually the GraalVM compiler um, it gets the improvement too, uh, because if we remove a lock in some library by rewriting it in a different fashion, uh, the benchmark will be a bit different. I mean, and, and the performance will look different on all uh, VMs. But sometimes uh, Hotspot improves uh, on its own. Uh, this is an example of um, of uh, the max in line level that got changed at some point in uh, JDK 14 and backported to JDK 11 because the Scala community uh, noticed that uh, increasing the max in line level helped in getting good performance on uh, on Scala. Uh, because simply the hotspot compiler has been designed at the time uh, the, the Scala workloads were not uh, were non-existent. So obviously optimizations need to come uh, later for this. So when the hotspot compiler improves, usually for us, it's not a bad news, uh, even if hotspot outperforms the GraalVM compiler. Uh, because it means that there is a low hanging fruit and that we can optimize uh, a pattern that we, are, that we were not optimizing before. And uh, usually by direct comparison between uh, Hotspot and, and GraalVM, 
uh, we can fix that uh, uh, fairly quickly. So in conclusion here, what we, I mean, the different approaches uh, to get better performance over time is, I mean, obviously good compiler research and development, uh, but regression tracking, making sure that uh, uh, change do not break performance on one, uh, one or more benchmarks. And um, make sure that we compare against the baseline and this moving target we need to take into account what what's changing uh, with the move with, with this moving target and make sure that we adapt and grab all the low hanging fruit that we uh, that we can find on the way so now uh, how can we find the uh, uh, opportunities from within the compiler uh, from within the, the gradvm compiler so that's uh, uh, the most interesting part, I think, it's where you you look how how we can tweak the the way the compiler behaves and see if there are opportunities there. So, uh, an, a simple approach is to look at the, the the compiler options that are available. So, the command line here will dump all options, all hotspot options, and dual options. And it will give you 668 flags for OpenJDK 11 or 9. Uh, since GraalVM, CE, and EE is built on top of OpenJDK, those flags are available there. Some are ignored because they are specific to hotspot typically, but the rest, like uh, GC settings, et cetera, they apply to, to all. Um, and for Graal, there are set, there is a set a fairly large set of uh, Graal options these days. In, in GraalVM 20.3, the community editions had 248 flags and the enterprise edition at 554, so more than 2x for the enterprise edition. Uh, the flags uh, that are part of uh, GraalVM can be categorized like this. So debugging and tracing flags like uh, enable uh tracing of something uh print com some compilation do some method features etc that's not interesting for us here but it's a very large portion of the of the flags obviously then there are flags that uh, debug debug uh, compiler faces by typically forcing a decision this is something that you will never want to use in production but typically instead of uh, doing uh, uh, heuristic, I mean, using a, a heuristic to, to take a decision, you can have a flag that says return yes all, uh, always for, uh, for this decision, uh, or return false always for that decision, and completely bypassing the heuristic. There is also a, a set of flags to enable or, or, or disable some uh, optimizations or even a, a, a complete compiler phase. So you see that there is a partial escape analysis equals true. You can try to disable it and see what's the impact there, for instance. Uh, and then there are the heuristics. And uh, all heuristics have uh, sometimes thresholds and uh, limits and boundaries, etc., because you don't want to uh, blow up uh, your exploration time, typically. And uh, plenty of trade-offs uh, have to be made as part of the compiler. So here's an example of uh, the loop policies in the GraalVM community edition. Uh, so you see some options, full on roll max nodes, full on roll max iterations, et cetera. So it means that you do not explore too much because at some point you, you have little benefit and you spend a lot of time compiling and exploring. Okay, so let's look at the second category, which is the debug compiler facing by forcing a decision. Uh, what uh, we tried is we have an option called uh, peel a lot, which basically forces uh, the peeling of all candidate loops. Uh, by doing so, we found that uh, several micro benchmarks uh, were improving and improving even greatly. And it's a debug flag that shouldn't affect uh, performance positively. It's usually just, I mean, it was there just to stress the, the peeling uh, 
um, optimization. And uh, some micro benchmark got up to 70% improvement or 50% for some others and 30% for some others. And uh, by looking into this, uh, there was actually a missed opportunity to hoist some uh, instance offs out of loops. And it has been fixed at some point uh, in the commit. You can check there. So this is a typical uh, uh, way of uh, finding low hanging fruits by trying non default configurations. Here we found uh, a way, I mean, a suboptimal pattern in the compiler. This is a flag that we will never use in production, but by stress testing, stress testing those flags and trying different uh, uh, comp um, uh, combinations, we can find this opportunity here. Okay, then um, about uh, tweaking the heuristics. That's where the fun begins because uh, compu uh, computing, computationally, uh, it's way more challenging if you want to explore numeric fields because let's say you have uh, uh, the max and roll uh, uh, nodes flag that, I that I've shown before, and you want to try this one on, uh, I don't know, all values between uh, 100 and 200, for instance, all the integer values. So how much time will that take? So to explore a set of values, uh, it will require B times N times N times T, meaning B is the number of benchmarks to test, because if you want to optimize for single benchmarks, well, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's just one dimension, but you do not get the full picture. So what we usually do when we explore uh, benchmarks uh, for, for optimizing some heuristics, we want to have a, a good overview of what's going on. And uh, what we'll do usually is what we, we will test uh, the main benchmark suite, meaning for instance, DACAPO benchmark suite, Scala bench, the Renaissance suite, SpecJVM benchmarks, et cetera. So this number B can be quite large. Then M is the number of values you want to test. So it can be 100 in our case. Uh, N can be the number of uh, repetitions of the benchmark to get reliable, reliable numbers. <clears throat> so in earlier, I've shown this chart where you have this, uh, this benchmark jumping around. We have noise uh, in all benchmarks to some level. Uh, sometimes it's very low, sometimes it can be larger, but if it's a few percent or few tens of percents, that can become problematic. So what uh, one wants to do is to run the benchmark uh, many times and get an average or get a, a feeling of what's the uh, actual performance of uh, this benchmark with this flag uh, set to that value. And you need to run that thing many times to, to get a good feeling of that. And then T is the number of uh, minutes that you'll need to run a single benchmark. And uh, so that's basically what you need. So you multiply all those numbers and you get the time needed to explore the space for that parameter. So let's keep it simple. Let's take a single value to test. So M equals one. But if you want to get a full picture and you want to test all the major well-known benchmark suites for the for for the JVM out there. So DACAPO, Scala Bench, Renaissance, and Spec JVM, that's roughly 60 benchmarks. Uh, if we say that uh, they take roughly five minutes, or we want to measure five minutes of this uh, those benchmarks, it's not that much because uh, uh, ideally we would want to run them for a longer period of time, but let's stick to five minutes. And uh, n here would be the number of uh, repetition to get a reasonable uh, average. A 10, it's really not much. Some benchmarks uh, to get a good number, a really good average, you would need like 30 or 50 uh, repetition of that. I think uh, there is a talk by uh, Peter Tuma later today that will, uh, that will uh, most likely cover uh, some of that and, and explain how many times you need to run benchmark to get good statistical data out of this. But with n equals 10, here you get a, a good approximation of this. So if you multiply all of that to get a single uh, benchmark, I mean, a single option, 
tested for a single value, you will need 50 machine hours. And this is for a single value of a single option. So now if you if you run a test uh, 100 different values, that will be 5,000 uh, hours. So that's roughly 2,000 days. So that's more than half a year. So obviously, if you want to do that kind of analysis, you need to scale out a bit and uh, use uh, many different machines and run those experiments concurrently. Uh, this is uh, uh, the good thing here is that it's, uh, it's an easy thing to do because it's individual benchmarks. Uh, if you are sure that uh, the, ben the, the servers behave, behave uh, the same way and give the roughly the same performance, then you should be, uh, you should be fine to, to scale out uh, up to as many machines as you have. So after weeks of, uh, of uh, benchmarking, we understood better how uh, the GraalVM Enterprise compiler reacts, reacts to its inliner option values. And uh, actually, we could find better default values for uh, some of the inliner parameters. And it improved the, the, the peak performance by 1 to 40 percent in the Renaissance, Scala Bench, and SpecGVM benchmarks by, yeah, by 1 to 40 percent and without extra compilation time or warm-up cost. So this is important because when we, ch when we change a default value, uh, we want to be sure that, uh, that we are not slowing down the, the, the compiler for everyone. So this was typically uh, very low hanging fruit in the term in terms of uh, uh, of the the change that was needed it was just uh, i mean just tweaking the defaults but it required a lot a lot of uh, machine hours to benchmark all of that and to get uh, to get a good overview of um, of all the the behavior i mean of the behavior of all those those uh, options uh, over all those uh, different ranges Okay. However, there are uh, options that uh, that uh, lead to great performance improvements sometimes, uh, but unfortunately, there are there is some um, uh, some compilation time cost. So in this uh, in this example, there is up to one percent improvement. This one is not the largest we found, but uh, uh, by by tweaking the value. So on the x-axis here, you have um, you have the option values. So the default is right in the middle where it's uh, zero. And the uh, improvements were close to 1% when uh, reducing that value. Uh, and uh, interestingly, if you increase the value, the performance degrades uh, significantly. But now if you look at the compilation time, it's a nice curve. Uh, so zero being the default here in the middle. And uh, if you decrease the value, so you will pay a price of like 18% uh, 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 compil extra compilation time to get this 1% performance gain. This, uh, this is aggregated over uh, all main uh, benchmark suite that have been tested. So this 1% is, is uh, on average. So it means that some will have uh, much larger improvement and some uh, may have no improvement at all or may even have uh, a decrease in performance but on average it, it's better so obviously for those we don't want to change the default so we will uh, we will stay with our default value but we, we learned something here on, on, on the way here is uh, another example uh, this one is about uh, the graph size uh, being explored by the, uh, the enterprise in liner. Uh, so if you decide to explore less, uh, I mean, smaller graphs, you will save time in save compilation time up to 8%, but you will pay a price in uh, roughly 1.5% reduction in, uh, in, uh, in peak performance in that case. And on the other hand, if you increase the, 
the budget uh, typically if you increase if you explore if you accept to explore larger graphs uh, to inline uh, you can get up to one percent improvement here but this will be this will have a, a huge price tag of uh, close to 20 percent uh, in um, in compilation time so what can we do with this uh, then let's expose those trade-offs to the users so what we've done here was uh, to expose a new GraalVM enterprise flag uh, called uh, tune inliner exploration uh, that can take values between uh, minus one and one. And the uh, default value being uh, being zero, meaning it's the default, uh, uh, it's the, I mean, the default uh, behavior of the compiler. And uh, if, you, if you set this value to, uh, to minus one or something closer to, to I mean, minus 0 0.5, for instance, it works. It's a, it's a real number uh, between minus one and one. It will uh, place you at some point on those graphs. So uh, a, a value of 0 0.5 will push you here to, towards greater uh, performance, but with an extra uh, cost. So, uh, so basically, a, a value close to one will increase the, the budget, and the value close to minus one will uh, reduce the budget. This is very interesting to, to do uh, this because uh, we typically do not want customers to touch uh, inliner flags by themselves because it can be pretty dramatic. Uh, because if they don't really know what they're doing, uh, they can, uh, they can blow up or the, the compilation time they can even crash the application if something wrong is going on so this ensures that uh, we are within safe bounds and that we do not blow up anything and that uh, that it's safe to play with this value between minus one and one and actually values out of the bounds are clamped to minus one and one so let's have a look on uh, some benchmarks here is a uh, the one of the, the, the capo benchmarks. Uh, here I show the, the warm up curve. So on the x axis, you have each iteration uh, number, if iteration uh, score reported by the, uh, by the, the, the benchmark suite. So here we run uh, 45, uh, slightly more than 45 iterations. So in uh, purple here, you have the default behavior of the GraalVM enterprise uh, compiler which warm ups are reasonably quickly and then we'll reach uh, a steady state so around 35 ish uh, iteration maybe slightly later and um, and this performance will be different if you if you tweak the the tune liner exploration flag so in that case the orange one is if we set the the tune liner exploration flag to minus 1 uh, warm up is uh, faster. I should have shown the, the very first iteration, the first two or three iterations. Uh, the purple curve is slightly below the, the, the pink one. Uh, the orange curve, sorry, is below the, the pink one. Uh, so we warm up uh, quicker, but we reach a steady state which has worse uh, 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 peak performance uh, than, uh, than the default case. On the other hand, uh, the, if we push the inliner exploration flag to one, then in that case, uh, the, we will pay a cost in compilation time in, and in warm up time too, and also in resources used to, to do the compilation. So the CPU utilization, et cetera, will be higher uh, at the beginning. However, uh, the compiler will be able to optimize the, the, the workload uh, in a smarter way and generate uh, more optimal um, uh, uh, machine code in the end, and the peak performance will be better. So this is uh, this is very interesting for our uh, customers because now, depending on the use cases, if you have, for instance, a, a long-running application on a server, a, a, a gigantic app that will run for for months, if not years then uh, you may be tempted to use that flag uh, to run uh, to run this workload and this may be a good choice so 
this is, uh, I mean, the disclaimer of this feature is that uh, you need to be careful because those decisions is being made based on the, an aggregate uh, of the of the results of across all benchmarks that we have. Uh, but some benchmarks do not benefit from this extra inlining, and uh, some will actually uh, benefit by inlining less and cutting the exploration earlier. So uh, uh, people should try the, the value, I mean, try the flag with different values and see how that interacts with their own uh, workflow. So the benefits can be, can be even larger than what we've seen here, uh, but they can also be none. Okay, so this uh, ends my overview of uh, the different uh, uh, approaches we have uh, in the compiler team to, to find speed up uh, opportunities. So first, uh, uh, the compiler research, then uh, the regression tracking, and uh, then the comparison against the baseline, and then those smarter approaches to, to find uh, uh, to find uh, 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 low hanging fruits by using non default configurations, but also exposed uh, by uh, by uh, exposed. I mean, which led to this uh, this new feature uh, that is now shipped with Gradvm uh, Enterprise Edition. Okay, thank you everyone for for listening and uh, joining today, and uh, I'm ready to take questions if you have any. Sure, let's uh, give Francois a big round of applause. You can use the emoji uh, uh, re reactions uh, if you have those buttons um, to applaud. Um, so any questions for Francois? So I can start out with uh, one. Uh, so I wasn't uh, necessarily paying attention to the middle of your talk. Did you say anything about uh, using uh, machine learning to find uh, your optimal um, set of parameters for inlining, for instance? I did not mention that, but that's a great question. Um, uh, this is actually something that has been uh, tried and used. Uh, interestingly, some years ago, I've uh, heard a talk by Chris uh, Tellinger. I heard that uh, you were doing this at Twitter too. Uh, we were already doing this uh, uh, as part of this project uh, at Oracle Labs. So that's interesting that we came up to the, to the same conclusion, which is that uh, using Bayesian optimization was indeed a good, uh, a good approach to, uh, to find uh, good, uh, good parameters uh, for uh, for those uh, those, those right. options. Now, um, I think this approach goes a bit further because with machine learning, unfortunately, you don't really know why uh, this was the, the most optimal uh, uh, solution. And usually what you'll do is that you'll, uh, you'll try to optimize one workload uh, uh, very uh, giraffely. I think that that's, that's a very, uh, interesting approach if you have uh, like the Twitter use case, uh, like you have one benchmark, you want to push really uh, 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 further and try to get the best out of this, uh, it's good because you will be able to fine tune for your specific use case. But that's definitely not something you want to do uh, at the global level for the compiler because it will be fine tuned for your application, but it will, it, it will uh, most likely degrade performance uh for other users so so yes this is something that has been used um but not pushed too far because uh because until a certain point doing exhaustive search was still possible and uh, was giving way more information that we could gather uh with uh, machine learning and Bayesian optimizations great thank you so we have a question from Alan. Alan, if you are able to unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask your question, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'm happy to read out your question. Yeah, hi. I was I was just wondering, um, because I, I work for ARM, so just wondering if you find a consistency of behavior between tweaking values on x86 and then doing those same tweaks on ARP64 to see 
if, if uh, you get roughly the same results? So this analysis has been only done for x86 at this stage. So that would be definitely an interesting to 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 try uh, to do the same thing on uh, on Rx64, definitely. But no, it has not been tested yet at all. Yeah, that's that's fine. I would I would expect something like inlining to behave the same, but it was just wondering if there's any more obscure things. But that's mm -hmm. fine. But that's definitely something uh, that would be interesting to investigate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question is from Peter. Uh, Peter, uh, do you want to speak uh, or? Yeah. Hi, okay. Uh, thanks, Francois. This is Peter Tuma from Charles University. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, do you consider uh, trying different uh, compiler options for different portions of the code as opposed to using the same settings for everything that the compiler compiles that partial run? I mean, changing the compiler behavior, you say, like at the per method level, for instance. That's right, because I, I've seen some work on other compilers mm -hmm. that showed that um, you can really find different settings for different functions, and mm -hmm. together they can uh, add up to a significant improvement. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm aware of that, but this, this has not been uh, done as part of this work now. But I think there are other projects. Uh, I don't want to claim things that may not be the case, but I think there are uh, ideas to explore this, especially in the ahead of time uh, compiler. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. The next question is from Fabio. Uh, Fabio, would you like to speak or should I read out your question? Yes. Uh, hi, Francois, and thanks for the talk. I was wondering, you mentioned the inlining heuristics and how you how you benchmark that. How do you design adaptive optimization strategies in general? And uh, would an adaptive approach make sense in the context of the inlining heuristics you mentioned? Um, when you say adaptive, you mean uh, changing the, the values over time, right? Yeah, change, changing them at runtime, right? Instead yeah. of defining the value uh, before you run the whole system. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely an approach that would be interesting to 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 tackle, but that's that's that has not been done. But I mean, the JVM tier compilation kind of does that in the sense that uh, you have uh, less aggressive optimization at the beginning and then more aggressive in the end. You could imagine having something similar, like uh, I, I was imagining the case where you basically unload the Gra compiler because the application is considered hot, and instead of doing that, uh, you could instruct the compiler to try a little harder if it if there's nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, use spare CPU cycles to just explore some things a bit further. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, there's one from uh, Michael. Michael, would you like to ask your question? Yes, a, a great talk. So I was considering when you were looking at the tuning of the machine learning for the inlining, were you taking any architectural, microarchitectural features? as part of the features that you were using in the training. So in particular, whether the TLB or the pressure on the level one instruction cast what was affecting your decision. Uh, no, not in this approach. This approach was is more about uh, considering the, the compiler a, a black box and play with the, its knob, but without uh, using Actual feedback or features. It's not. It's not really a uh, machine learning project. Yeah, I think there will be a talk later on uh, by, from Rafael uh, Mozaner about uh, machine learning uh, uh, used in the context in the context of the inliner. I think that that's uh, the kind of work that we, that it could be applied to. But no, we don't do, do uh, uh, fancy uh, uh, feature extraction here. Right. 
Uh, if there are no more questions, let's uh, give uh, Francois another round of applause. And thank you so much, Francois, for joining us uh, at this workshop today. Sure. Thank you very much for having me and uh, looking forward for the rest of uh, the CGO workshop.